We'll get more reaction to the former president, Jacob Zuma's late night entry to that correctional facility in Escort in KwaZulu-Natal. Through the day, you've seen all sorts of views, developments around the arrest of the former president, currently in the Correctional Services Center in Escort, serving that 15-month term instituted by the Constitutional Court. It is, I suppose, a climax of an incredible two-week period, but also an important part of a much bigger story, a story that goes back many, many years. Zuma's dominated, dominated our politics for easily the last 15 years. He's appeared to dominate the ANC for a long time too and has been a major player really in all of the developments probably from the 1970s onwards. Tony Leon is a former leader of the DA. That's probably how you remember him. He's a former ambassador. He's also one of the people who was involved in negotiating our constitution during the 1990s. Tony, good afternoon to you. I mean, look, a lot's been happening. But back in the 1990s, watching the constitutional negotiations that were underway, did you ever think someone who would be elected president in South Africa when it would end up being arrested? No, I never thought it was remotely likely, although, of course, as uh, Dick Hanwasnek and others have said, the weakness of our constitution is we vest enormous powers in the president, and it was fashioned around an iconic figure like Mandela, and uh, he didn't add, but I can add, and you land up with a legal delinquent like Jacob Zuma, and I guess... The Constitution is only as strong or as weak as its weakest point, and the president or the former president is a very weak point. But I, I think the, the most important lesson, and it's true of the United States Constitution, which has been going a lot longer than ours in the time of Nixon and his defiance, and our own under Zuma, is that the courts actually don't have any power. They have, of course, a lot of theoretical power, but their actual power of the purse and their power of the sword is in the hands of the state. And therefore, if the state doesn't act in uh, enforcing judgments, then those judgments are not worth the paper that they're written on. So I think that's why last night's event, as you indicate, lastminute.com, as it might have been, was singularly important for our constitutional well-being and health. And it was a stress test, which we survived just in time. Uh, one of the things we keep talking about, and there's a phrase we hear in, in our sort of national conversation, is we often talk about this is the first time this has happened in our democratic history. Um, in fact, this has never happened before in South Africa's history as a nation state, or even, if I may say, before then. I mean, the thing I've been looking for, the sort of comparable financial scandal in a way um, during the apartheid era was probably the Impogate scandal. No one went to jail for that that I remember. Someone sort of skipped the country. But, you know, the politicians involved were never held accountable in the way that we're seeing happen here. I think that's entirely true. <laughs> and, and the irony of Infogates, as it was in 1978 or so, is that the, 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 there were no legal consequences uh, for the delinquency and the misuse of state funds, although they weren't used for personal enrichment, they used for politically improper purposes. But ironically, the political system inside the National Party worked far more ruthlessly and effectively than the ANC's has done. So the National Party immediately got rid of the chief culprit, Connie Mulder, who left Parliament and the party. And then shortly afterwards, John Forster, who was a prime minister who became the president, then was removed from the presidency because of that scandal. Whereas, of course, the ANC took much longer to act against Jacob Zuma. And so I, I think your comparison is, is correct, but it only goes so far. You know, one of the things that's largely forgotten now is KwaZulu-Natal, as you know, has been the epicenter of a lot of uh, political uh, intrigue and violence and worse. But in 1995, there was a terrible standoff between Nelson Mandela, the president, and Mangasutu Butlesi, then the leader of the Nkata Freedom Party, where violence was threatened and Mandela quite unconstitutionally said to cut off the funds of the province. And that was eventually sorted out behind closed doors. But what's interesting is that this week in South Africa, the voice of authority who spoke was strange enough, not the president who's kept completely quiet, but one Mangasutu G. Butlesi who described the events around Nkandla pending or prior to the arrest of Zuma as being basically unconstitutional and a violation of the Constitution. So, you know, the, the temperature has gone up in that neighborhood a lot over the last 25 years and again last night.
Um, I mean, there are all sorts of conversations around all of this, and you, you talk about what happened in 1995. Uh, your memory of that will be better than mine. Something else that happened, I mean, it strangely involves rugby, of course, was the Louis Late case, um, where mm. then-President Nelson Mandela went into the dock. In other words, he accepted the subpoena. He said he would go and testify and that he was bound by the court. And, and I sort of wonder if what we saw last night um, wouldn't have happened if Nelson Mandela hadn't done that. And I mean, there were various cases there. It was a big moment when he did that. But there's definitely a sort of line between then and now. Oh, look, uh, Mandela was a, a legally compliant president, and he, he was at pains to do so. And I think the Louis Light case you mentioned is a very important one because he was subpoenaed. In fact, the judge uh, took an adverse uh, to, uh, view of the testimony of Nelson Mandela. And Mandela said that, and I'm paraphrasing what he said uh, in the witness stand, that it pained him to do this, but he was doing it because of the respect he had for the court. And a while before, when the Western province government brought a case against the government concerning the Liquor Act, and they won it, and the government, the national government, lost it, <clears throat> Mandela called a press conference, which was the first time the Constitutional Court ruled against the government, and he said, I just want you to know, he told the press in his heart and garden, that the government accepts judgments that go against it. And I think that was a very pivotal moment in our very young constitutional democracy, as it was in the mid-1990s. And the late case was, it was another example of Mandela's legal compliance. With Zuma, you've had the complete opposite. It's been defiance, it's uh, legal delinquency. It has been, in the words of the Zondo Commission's counsel in court this week in Peter Maritzburg, uh, recalcitrance. And I think the courts actually in South Africa, and perhaps understandably given the political personality involved, have been exquisitely deferential and patient with Jacob Zuma. And eventually their patience ran out and they acted as they needed to act and it took quite a while, but they did it. And I, I think, you know, it's not just what we think, Stephen, you and I, but I think around the world, just reading the newspapers today, the Financial Times in London, the New York Times in obviously New York, uh, notice has been taken. I think so. Ironically, it's a very bad day for Jacob Zuma and his followers. It's a very good day for South Africa and the renewed strength of its constitutional democracy. Um, the, what, key to this, to my mind anyway, was the, the ANC's press conference and statement, not yesterday, but on Tuesday. Um, and this was a statement by the NEC. Now, look, Tony, I, I know that you're a former leader of the DA, um, so, so, I, so I ask you this question carefully. Um, but there was a key issue that they mentioned. They spoke about the Constitution, but they also used the phrase constitutionalism. And I wonder if this is a moment that really defines that South Africa is going to be a state guided by constitutionalism. The difference, of course, is that our Constitution can be changed in a de democratic way. If we want to do that, we can choose to do that. But constitutionalism, that principle, could almost be more important than the Constitution itself. It absolutely is. And I, I think, you know, it's worth underlining uh, what they said in that statement. Although I do think a statement by the president might be more powerful because he represents the whole country, not just the political party. But leaving that aside, I think you're correct, because what is constitutionalism? It's, it's the spirit of the Constitution. It's not just the letter of the law, but it's the, it's the entire uh, edifice, if you like, of the rule of law. And, and the basis of the rule of law, with, without, you know, being pedantic, is that everyone is equal before it and none are beyond its reach. And obviously... You know, we always say hard cases make bad law. I think in the case of this, although it's incidental, I, I mean, Zuma is the author of his own demise here. He could have gone before the Zondo Commission, given some garbled accounts of state capture, and he would have met the very modest requirements of the subpoena. The fact that he didn't or thought he need not be bothered by something as legally uh, inconsequential in his mind, at least as a subpoena, I think speaks volumes, and that's what forced the action. Of course, there are other matters related to Jacob Zuma which have yet to see the light of day or the end of the tunnel, and, and those will perhaps be more consequential. But in terms of sending a signal, I think the spirit of constitutionalism, to use that phrase, the NEC, is alive and well and arguably refreshed after the events of last night.
There's been this idea in, in human history, and it maybe took hold after the fall of communism in 1989, which of course had its own consequences, 89, 1990, had its own consequences in, in South Africa and Southern Africa, and there's a long debate, I mean, Tony, you, again, you'll know better than I do, uh, that, that, that would democracy have come here if the Berlin Wall hadn't fallen? But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that from that moment, there was this idea that a country could go from repression to democracy in one move. And in fact, we haven't really seen that. And the Middle East is a great example of all of the countries that went through the uh, North African <coughs> revolutions from Tunisia onwards. Only one of those countries now is properly democratic. South Africa, though, despite all of our problems, and let's be clear, there are plenty of them, our racialized inequality, perhaps chief among them, unemployment, corruption. But South Africa, though, has tried very hard to go from repression to constitutionalism in one move. I think there were some people who felt that maybe it couldn't be done. And yet here we are, maybe a generation and a half after repression, and a former president is currently in prison. Yeah, I think that's a great question, Stephen. And, you know, uh, let me hazard one attempt at an answer beyond what you've suggested. And I think the big difference in South Africa, even under apartheid and the previous repressive uh, era, is that there were very strong institutions. I mean, the independent courts, although the justices were circumscribed by what they could do, did operate uh, even under apartheid. And the bar, the legal bar, was, you know, home to some of the most eminent and independent-minded people, from George Bezos to Sidney Kentridge, indeed, to Vim Trengove himself. So you, you had, and then you, you had a media which operated, well, you would remember, in, in very problematic circumstances, but there were independent voices in the media, ranging from, uh, you know, the Mail and Guardian to the city press, even under apartheid. So, and however difficult it was then, and of course, you know, the one thing the National Party did, uh, perhaps not realizing consequences, was in 1979 to legalize trade unions in this country. So you had this huge body of organized workers who weren't just, you know, involved in worker issues, but were involved in political issues, the UDF and so on. And all those predated the change from apartheid to democracy or happened during that very turbulent transition. And I think the fact that we had those institutions um, in that were independent of the states and not just uh, dependent on its patronage, often the opposite, and that they lived on after apartheid into the new South Africa were critical and important moments. So I think a lot of the other would-be democracies you mentioned in North Africa and uh, the Arab world didn't have those. There were no points of mediation other than the strongman president or arguably the, the religious leaders, and there was nothing else. And so to try and then build a democracy without any of the building blocks, except perhaps for an election, is a much more difficult task. And I think South Africa was gifted, apart from some really providential leadership at the time of transition with those facts and those institutions which were built on. And, you know, even though Zuma did his best to try and suborn quite a few of them, he did not succeed. And I think uh, the bitter fruits for him, but perhaps the better harvest for the country, is borne out by the results of last night. Tony Leon, I really do appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. Someone involved, of course, in what was going on in the 1990s, former leader of the Democratic Alliance also.